Thank you. Um, so in this lecture, I will. Uh, Oh, in this lecture, I will uh, discuss uh, some problems of uh, diffusion of energy in chains of oscillators. So I won't discuss the problem of anomalous diffusion like in the uh, Herbert's lectures. I will just concentrate on the case where you have normal Fourier law. And I will try to show you that even in this case, there are some interesting problems which can be addressed and which are still difficult to, to study. So let me start with the model we are interested in. Uh, so the models are the same uh, in um, Herbert's lecture. So we consider some chains of anharmonic oscillators, which are described by some Hamiltonian H, which takes the following form. So it is a sum over X. So X denote is, uh, okay, usually what I will take is uh, just uh, the infinite volume limit directly initially, so I consider the system on some infinite uh, dimensional lattice, ZD. Okay, and each X, in fact, represents the, the equilibrium position of uh, your atom. And then uh, each atom with uh, equilibrium position X has some velocity PX. So that the kinetic energy is PX squared divided by 2 then you can assume that there is some interaction between nearest neighbor particles. Okay, so here this notation denotes the particle which are nearest neighbor particles close to X. And then you have some interaction potential V, QI minus QX, plus some pinning potential W. And corresponding to this, uh, so here I, I, okay, this is a formal Hamiltonian since it is some infinite sum, but in fact we can make sense of the dynamics corresponding to this Hamiltonian, which is just given by the Newton's equation. So we say that uh, d of px is equal to minus dh dt and d of qx it's just Px dt. Okay, so we can make sense of these uh, dynamics. And uh, what we'd like to do is to study the macroscopic behavior of physics. And uh, this is, uh, even in the case where you have normal diffusion, it is a very difficult problem from a mathematical point of view. So usually we expect that if this uh, pinning potential is present, we have uh, normal diffusion. And, uh, and I will consider only in this uh, lecture the case where you have normal diffusion. So I won't discuss the problem of superdiffusion, which I discussed in the, in the talk of Stefano. Okay. Um, so, so let me look at the conserved quantities. So of course. So the particles are labeled by letters. Yes. Uh, so you mean this is formal, okay? Yeah. But the physics equation, you see, well, it is purely local. Label the particles just one, two, three. Yeah. Yes. Why not? Assign them to a lattice position, right? Yes, it is fixed. Uh, now, does the lattice position mean that? Main or is this just well, another way of keeping the particle? In other words, are the Q's bounded, or can they be? No, it is not necessarily bounded. Yes, okay. not necessarily bounded. So, so, so the the displacement. Yes, it is a displacement with respect to the equilibrium position, but it can be uh, as large as you want. No, no, but uh, I think the question is that Q X is the displacement respect of the particle X from a certain lattice position. Yes. Yes, that I fix to be x, essentially. Because, well, if you talk of diffusion, you like to think of... Uh, ah, it can be some transport, yes. But if you spin to a lattice position, you limit There's no diffusion of particles, no diffusion of density. It's a diffusion of energy. 
a diffusion of yeah. Okay, so we have uh, several conserved quantities. Uh, and of course, it would diffuse. I mean, if you have an infinite lattice, every particle would diffuse. Uh, so, what does it mean to diffuse? So, I am only interested in the diffusion of energy, not yeah, in the but diffusion I'm of. It would diffuse anyway. So given this model, it would diffuse. Uh, there will be transport of particles, okay. and they may eventually diffuse. Yes, maybe. Yes, it's possible. It would. Uh, yes, it could be, yes. Okay, so you have three uh, conserved quantities, which is the first one is of course the energy, which is the sum of the individual energy. So I denote it by E x zero for some. Sorry. If you tell them now that there are three conserved quantities, they are going to confuse them for everything. One conserved quantity. I say that there are several conserved quantities. Sometimes there are three, sometimes two, sometimes one. Okay. So, this quantity is always conserved, which is the sum of the individu individual energies. Okay, the sum of the kinetic energy plus interaction, e interaction, interaction energy. Plus the pinning energy. Then, uh, so now it depends yeah, you can have also some other conserved quantity depending if you have some pinning potential and you, in which dimension you are. So in particular, okay, you prefer to put one half, yes, or one over two d. Is your question? No. Okay. Uh, then you have also, if w is equal to zero, if you don't have any potential, then you can check that the momentum is also conserved. But essentially, I won't consider the case where you have conservation of momentum, because if you have conservation of momentum, you could expect usually that you have an amplitude peak. So essentially, this is a case that I won't consider. Okay, and uh, now, this is, uh, now there is a distinction between dimension 1 and dimension bigger than 1. Uh, okay. So there is a distinction between dimension one and dimension bigger than one. So in dimension one, so it is better to, like uh, did Herbert in his um, lecture, it is better to, um, to write the equation not in terms of the Qx, but in terms of the inter, um, on the, in terms of the Rx, so d equal one and w equal to zero, okay? So you write Rx, which is Qx plus 1 minus Qx. So the interdistance inter inter dis inter between particles. And then in this case, you have this quantity, which can be, which at first sight seems to be trivial, which is also conserved. OK, because then if W is equal to zero, so you can forget this term, and you can write the Hamiltonian in terms only on the Px and the Rx. And then you can check very easily that this quantity is conserved. Sometimes it is forgotten, but when you are, uh, it is a quantity which appears, for example, in the... I don't, there is also the momentum which is conserved, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, but this follows conserved. The second sort of momentum. Yes, yes. But anyway, we are, if this is a quantity that you have con to consider, okay? If you write the Euler equations, I will write the Euler equation like in the Abbott's lecture, it is written with three conserved quantities. You have to take into account these, uh, these conser conserved quantities. And, okay, if you are in dimension bigger than one, um, okay, then you, uh, you don't have these, uh, these, of course, you cannot do these the same, and uh, you don't have these uh, conserved quantities. Okay, so you can have three conserved quantities in dimension one if you have no pinning, but uh, if you have pinning, you have essentially um, one conserved quantity, which is the energy. Okay, if you want to, to study the problem of diffusion of energy in the system of theaters, there is 
from a mathematical point of view, the first problem is uh, to uh, consider the, the, the set of equilibrium measures and to show that uh, you have some ergodic uh, dynamics. Okay? So the equilibrium measure is, of course, given by the Gibbs measure. Okay, so the Gibbs measure are given by... Um, okay. So Gibbs measure are equilibrium measure, which are given for... Um, so let me consider, for example, the case of where you... Uh, where you have some pinning potential, so in this case you have only one conserved quantity, and the Gibbs measure is only parameterized by uh, the inverse of the temperature. So this measure, which is given by this probability measure, which formally is equal to, um, which is proportional to exponential of minus beta h divided by some normalization constant is invariant for the dynamics. Of course, this measure doesn't make sense since we are in infinite volume, but uh, you can make sense by using what is called the dobruchin lanford real um, equations. So for finite, infinite volume, this measure makes perfectly sense, and you can extend to infinite volume. Okay, it is, uh, there is some general theorem. It is formally, it is phase one, even if it doesn't make really sense. There is a case where it is, um, particularly easy to, to make sense of this measure is the case in dimension one and W equal to zero. So in this case, you have three conserved quantities. Since, since you have three conserved quantities, the Gibbs measure are parameterized by three uh, parameters. Here you had only one conserved quantities, but now if you have three, you have um, three parameters which parameterize parameterize the, the equilibrium measure, okay, and I have to write the equilibrium measure in terms of the P and the R. And it is given by one of some normalization constant, or maybe it is here, in this case it is just a product measure. So it makes perfectly sense, exponential of minus beta uh, EX minus lambda Rx minus um, p bar px, drx dpx. In this case, you have some um, product measure, and these are equilibrium measure for the dynamics, for the infinite volume dynamics. Okay? So now the central problem of uh, the first problem that you have is that uh, you would like to say that these measure in some sense as a unique measure of your dynamics. Okay, this is the ergodic problem, which appears naturally when you try to do statistical physics. And uh, even if it is classical mechanics, in fact, the notion of ergodicity is not so well defined for infinite systems. Of course, for finite system, you can, you can you have some notion of ergodicity, but you also know that uh, this is uh, a big problem to show that some system, even in finite volume, is uh, ergodic because you have all this CAM theory will tell you that if you have some integrable system, okay, you don't have, you have a lot of conserved quantities and the system is not ergodic. And if you take some small, um, small perturbation around this integrable system, you expect usually that you will be uh, ergodic, chaotic. But we know from the CAM theory that it is not true. And what is expected is that if you take the thermodynamic limit, then the system will become ergodic, okay? But uh, then this is just some end waving uh, explanation. If you want really to start with some, um, with some mathematical approach, you have to define what you mean by ergodicity, okay? And uh, so this notion of ergodicity for infinite volume dynamics is not so clear how to define it. So I will propose some definition, which is maybe, maybe not the, the right one, but at least it is the notion that we need in order to, to do some mathematics with this kind of systems. So what is the notion of ergodicity that I will uh, use? Um, so this is the definition of, that I propose of ergodicity for infinite system. Okay. Maybe it is 
I don't claim that it is the correct notion of ergodicity, and maybe, in fact, we don't need uh, such a so strong notion of ergodicity to derive um, idonomic limits for his law and so on. Maybe we need something weaker. But at least if it is a notion which is well adapted to, to do mathematics. So what is the definition of ergodicity that I will use? It is the following. Um, okay, the only space-time invariant measures, probability measures, which are regular, so I will precise what means regular, which are regular, are convex combinations of Gibbs measures. Okay, this is a definition that I adopt for the ergodicity for some infinite uh, system. Um, so, space-time invariant probability measure means just that it is invariant by the shift okay, of the coordinates, and time invariant means that it is invariant in time, and then a regular means that if you compute the relative entropy of the restriction of your measure in some box, with respect to some Gibbs measure in the same box, then it is bounded by a constant times the size of the box, the volume of the box. Okay, this is the notion of regular regularities that I use. And then we say that the system is ergodic infinite volume if we have this property. Okay, in fact, uh, we know that for some system, this notion of ergodicity is not the right one. And for example, you have some example in which we know that it is not true. It is, for example, the, um, okay, for the total lattice, for the harmonic chain, Okay, when you take uh, V and W quadratic, the system has a lot of, uh, of conserved quantities, an infinite number of conserved quantities. It is some interval system, and then it is not ergodic. And we cannot avoid the case where if you choose, don't choose carefully your uh, potential V on W, you are not outside some um, interval system or close to some interval system. And for example, the total lattice, which correspond to the case where W is equal to zero, dimension one, and V, which is in exponential form, then is also completely interable, as an infinite number of conserved quantities cannot be ergodic. Okay, but to expect that for a large class of potential, we should be um, ergodic. Okay, for the moment. Yeah. Hmm? Why do you want? Space invariance. Uh, this one are space invariants. Okay, so usually what you when you have to when you have to prove some. Um, so, no, okay. Space invariance. What does it mean? Space invariance. Space invariance means the following. It means that if if you introduce, okay, space invariance. So you have your uh, configuration space, which is say omega, which is the set of the px and qx, x in z, okay, for in dimension one. And then uh, the, you introduce the shift, which is just a to, tau x applied to some uh, function of the p on the q, just f of p y plus x, Q, Y plus X. So you shift all the coordinates, the, you shift respect to the lattice. You shift by X respect to the lattice. And then this is, when I say st spa um, space invariant, it is, it is invariant respect to this action on the set of, uh, the set of uh, function. No, 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 W doesn't depend on X. It is here, it is fixed. It doesn't depend on X. Ah, yes. Why do you want this? 
Okay, if you, okay, it is uh, quite technical, but uh, if you want to prove uh, hydrodynamic limits, something like that, in fact, this is, you only need to consider the, the space invariance probability measure. Of course, you could be interested also in the non, non, um, non space invariant probability measure, but it is what appears naturally when you try to derive the macroscopic equations. Okay. Yes, but you can have other integral of the motion which are not translation invariant, but they, are not, they may survive the yes, they may survive limit and they don't. Yes, I remember a theorem, but I don't think that I'm sure I have to say on the energy shell diffuse potential, you are always find spinal fluids and that only causes. But it was not in infinite dimension, the theorem that you mentioned, no. I, it, think it's, uh, I don't think so. I think that the ergodicity in, for infinite dimension systems that does not exist any mathematical result. Well, I always thought the solution was that raised number of the fraction because it was occupied by Okay, yes, it is what we expect, but uh, you know, if you want to make it uh, very precise for, for the need that we, for what we need in order to derive macroscopic equation, uh, I don't know if it is sufficient for us. At yeah, least, okay. fees is sufficient for us. I'm not sure that what yeah, you... Okay, then I think this would formally not be satisfied because we... Fees is a perfect def definition, it's perfectly precise, no? Uh, but you have the probability measure which is confined to such a little bit island. Also, no, but I say that it has to be regular. Regular, regular? Me, regular means that the relative entropy, uh, relative entropy of uh, the probability measure restricted to some box, with respect to the Gibbs measure restricted to the box, is of order the volume of the box. So it means, in particular, that you have some density with respect to the Beck measure when you look at the marginals. So it avoids this uh, kind of, uh, of pathologies, yes. Space, space does not go to the measure of the gas. There is no very few degrees between. Well, I think it's zero. Lorentz gas, you mean one particle moving or, 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 or uh, many particles? I thought also from the past. Reservoir gas and a high-dimensional gas. But not smooth interaction. One of the questions is what are the interactions for which this property would be good? I mean, certainly there are two counterexamples which are completely It would be interesting to have. Uh, Counterexamples which are not completely integral. No, certainly not completely integral. But there are tiny regions of phase space where it looks like integral. And this space, the measure of this phase space, does not go to zero with the, the number of particles per two things. I That's think the fraction do. of phase space where this occurs. No, of course, but does it not? The, the question is, does it not go to zero? It remains strictly positive as the number of Particle goes to infinity. There is such a theory. Um, no, it doesn't. So that, 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 that is the question. Yes, this is the main question. We have to look at the system, infinite volume the, system. The final, the fi for final system. Yeah, no, 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 I think it will go away in at least if you're print it almost to zero. Well, then, 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 then no, be fine. that's that's why it's Okay. Um, <coughs> So this is the notion of ergodicity that I introduced, and of course we are not able to prove for any system that the system is really ergodic in this sense. So you have to do something in order to to uh, to, to to prove to prove a theorem. So what we I think it was introduced. Um, okay, there is a theorem which is used to uh, to Fritz. Unaki and uh, Leibovitz in the middle of the 90s, which is the following. 
So um, if um, mu is a probability measure, which is space-time invariant, space-time invariant, regular and which satisfies and which is uh, exchangeable I will precise what means exchangeable in the velocities, in the p's okay, then it is a convex combination of Gibbs measure. So what means exchangeable? It means uh, that if you have your, your, probability, your probability measure, and now you, you choose some site x, and you exchange px with, uh, you choose two sites, or one site, px and px, px plus one, and you exchange px with px plus one. So it, you get some new probability measure by doing this operation. And uh, what is uh, exchangeable means that you don't modify the law. Okay, so you have the law on the P on the Q. You modify, you exchange Px with Px plus one, and then you, you keep the same law. It is the same, the same probability measure. It is a notion of exchangeability. So this theorem, it is a real theorem, so they can prove in this sense that it is, of course, some, some weaker form of this ergodicity result. But they were able to, to show that. And I think that there is some C nice conjecture, which is that if you have only it remains true if it is exchangeable only for one side, say zero, for example. Okay, so it means that if you exchange, for example, um, two or two sides, if you want, P0 and P1, two sides, if you want. Yes, no, you cannot exchange one, okay, for two sides. Okay. So you, uh, it is a conjecture, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know. And uh, this is, okay, this is the result, and of course, we cannot uh, show it for, uh, for, the, um, for, the, for the Hamiltonian dynamics. So, but uh, with this result, uh, the idea is then to introduce some new dynamics, which uh, still, for which these, uh, the invariant measures are always exchangeable in the piece. And is motivate the introduction of the following um, of the following dynamics. So this is the stochastic dynamics now, which has been explained, in fact, in the talk of Stefano. So which consists to the following. Uh, I'm not so sure. It's not so clear. It is a conjecture. What do you know about the state of the Do you know what are the extreme? What we know about. Um, so you have a large set of. Uh, of of uh, natural, uh, natural. Uh, solutions of this DLR, do you know any properties? Uh, it is well defined for some interaction potential. Just fundamentals. So it's a unique. There is a ah, no, you can, but you can have some phase transitions, yes. Third dimension. Uh, in, what, in which dimension? Ah, no, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, higher in higher dimension, yeah. It could be, no? 
Ah, in one so dimension, in one yes. Dimension uh, is unique. There yes, is a unique, yes. Uh, but in higher dimension, you could have some. But in higher the end, it's difficult to characterize. I mean, you don't know it. I mean, for easing, we know in two dimensions. But okay, for here I don't we know. don't know. Maybe we know. I don't know. Me, I don't know. But yes, harmonic chains. Harmonic chains. Harmonic chains. But we, there is no, so we don't know what are the extreme of our construction. So as you will get the infinite volume, you might prefer putting boundary conditions. Yeah. 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 Okay, so it motivates the introduction of the following stochastic dynamics in order to restore the, the ergodicity of uh, the infinite volume dynamics directly from, uh, from the beginning, not assuming that uh, is the validity of, uh, of the exchangeability condition. So what is the dynamics? So here you have time and here you have space. Okay, which is, for example, I, I just look now in dimension one. Okay, you have Z and here you have the time. T, and what you do is, so you have so your lattice, one, two, three, and so on, x, x plus one, and on each lattice, on each uh, nearest neighbor point, what you do is that you put some Poisson process. Okay, so it means that here you have a Poisson process with some exponential time here, then some other exponential time, so other exponential time, and so on. Okay, and you do it for any, for any, uh, nearest neighbor, um, nearest neighbor sites with independent Poisson processes. Okay, and you do it in the infinite volume. Of course, it is a little bit complicated to do it in the infinite volume, but imagine that it is just finite volume. Okay, so you have a, only a finite number of Poisson processes. What you do is that you start your dynamics following the Hamiltonian dynamics. And then you look at the first time for which you have some, um, some, uh, some clock which rings. Okay, you have some clocks on each nearest neighbor side, which are with exponential times. You look at the first time. So up to this first time, you just follow the Hamilton dynamics. And then this, uh, you, are, you are at the time for which you have the clock which rings. You exchange P1 with P2. Then you continue your dynamics and you wait for the next time for which you have uh, some clocks with rings, and you exchange px with px plus one. In such a way, you see that, uh, and then you continue the Hamilton dynamics, you wait for the next clock, you exchange px with px plus one, and so on. And then, of course, when you exchange px with px plus one, you conserve the A energy, okay, because you have only in the energy the sum of the px square, and you also conserve uh, the other conserved quantity in the case where they are conserved. Okay, for example, the momentum is also conserved by phase noise. Okay, so you can write, okay, if you want a formula, we can write the generator of the dynamics as the sum of two parts. Okay, if this is, the first part is due to the Hamiltonian dynamics and the second part is due to the noise, gamma S. Okay, what is A? So A is the Hamiltonian, the generator corresponding to the Hamiltonian dynamics, which is the sum over X of um, Px dQx so, uh, minus dH, dH dQx uh, dPx. Okay, this is the generator of the Hamilton dynamics. And then you have the noise, which is regulated regulated by some uh, parameter gamma strictly positive, which is the intensity of the noise. So typically the, the mean time between two 
um, uh, two uh, rings of the clock is one over gamma, and S is just the operator which is defined by acting on some test function f, just consists to exchange at some uh, random sites px with px plus one. Y, and here you have px plus one px, where it is a site x, x plus one minus f of p. Okay, this is the configuration which obtain, which is obtained by changing px with px plus one. Okay, okay. If, if you don't like what uh, the notion of generator, you can just the generator is the adjoint of the operator which appears in the Fokker-Planck equation. Okay, so if you want to write the Fokker-Planck equation, you have that dt of um, the probability measured find the system at time t in configuration with p and q is just equal to um, the adjunct of L times P. Okay? But uh, what I will use is essentially the, the generator of the dynamics. So I prefer to write it in this way. But if you don't like, you are just to think that it is the adjunct of the operator which appears in the Fokker-Planck equation. Okay. Okay. Oh, so this is... Uh, natural uh, dynamics that you can consider, which in some sense simulate uh, what the, the, the anomalic potential should do, should mix the velocities. And if you introduce these dynamics, you can really show directly that the microsc microscopic dynamics is ergodic, in the sense that I, I gave before, because of this theorem. Okay, it is clear that see, with, the, with the introduction of this noise, the merger which are invariant for the dynamics are exchangeable, okay? Because here it has to be, okay, you have some work in fact, but uh, you can show that they are exchangeable, so the system is ergodic, the infinite system is ergodic. And this is sufficient to derive, for example, the Euler equations, the Euler equations which was introduced by, uh, by Herbert in his lectures, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> okay, but, uh, okay, there is some, some small uh, problem in the case of diffusion of energy with this kind of noise is that, uh, in principle, it conserves momentum. And we know that if we have conservation, usually when we have conservation of momentum, we could have uh, super diffusion of energy. So we will do something else. Of course, we will could consider the case of, an, uh, of pin chain with this noise, but we will do something else, we will consider the case where we take the Hamiltonian dynamics and we perturb it by some other noise for which we will have some ergodicity and which destroys the conservation of momentum. So let me explain what it is. So essentially it is quite similar. So the definition of the stochastic model is quite similar, but uh, its effect will be very different since we want have the conservation of uh, the momentum. So what is the dynamics? Now, this is not this dynamics that I will consider. I will consider the following. With a generator L, okay, which is always a, which corresponds to the Hamiltonian part, okay, this is the Liouville operator, plus, okay, I will use the same notation, but I won't consider this case, where S now is the flipping noise, which is the following. So it's action on the, on test function. F is just given by, you start with some configuration of position velocities, and what you do is that you select some site, x, randomly at some random exponential time, and you just flip the velocity of the site x. So it is, the configuration is py and so on, on minus px on the site x minus the initial condition. Okay. 
Okay, so what is this uh, dynamics? So it is essentially the same, but now what you do is it is the construction is almost the same. So on each side you put some uh, Poissonian clock. with some random exponential times. And between two rings of the clocks, you follow the Hamilton dynamics. And when you arrive at some time for which there is a clock with rings, you just flip the velocity of the site, for example, here, 1 into minus P, P1. Then you continue the Hamilton dynamics. Then, for example, you arrive at this time for which the clock rings, and you just flip the velocity of side 2, P2, into minus pi, P2. Okay? So you see clearly that uh, this uh, microscopic dynamics does not, conserve the, um, does not conserve the momentum, even if it was conserved by the Hamilton dynamics. Okay, the sum of the Px, the momentum, is not conserved by the, is not conserved. even if it was conserved initially by the Hamilton dynamics, because when you flip Px into minus Px, it doesn't remain conserved. But otherwise, the, the energy, the sum of the Ex, is conserved by the dynamics. And um, okay, in dimension one, you have also the sum of the Rx, which is conserved. And uh, with these dynamics, you can also prove some theorem uh, close to Fritz von Leibovitz, for which you can show that the unique uh, space-time invariant and regular measures um, for these new dynamics are convex combination of Gibbs measure with zero momentum, okay? zero average momentum. So the, in some sense, you have some ergodicity of these uh, microscopic dynamics, and the, 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 the invariant measures are given by the Gibbs measure with a zero average moment. Okay? So now this is the dynamics I will consider, and since we don't have conservation of momentum, what we expect is that you have normal diffusion, normal diffusion of energy. Okay? And we start with some well-behaved dynamics for which we know that there is this ergodicity which is usually necessary to, to prove some local equilibrium state. But, <coughs> In fact, it is not, it is still some difficult problem to prove really that you have Fourier's law, even starting with his dynamics. Um, so the goal, prove Fourier's law of his dynamics. Okay, so this dynamics is conservative in the is conservative in the energy. So it means that if you compute the time derivative of the energy e x, what you will get is some microscopic continuity equation in the form of minus okay g x x plus one minus g x minus one x. So this is a discrete gradient, and this gradient is given by... Okay, now I will consider only the case in dimension one, and say where you have some pinning potential. Okay, but in fact the pinning potential won't appear in the, in the current. So you have some microscopic current which takes the form of minus... Um, okay, what is... Uh, Maybe it's not so important. So it is essentially minus Px times V prime of Qx plus 1 minus Qx. Okay, maybe this expression is not totally correct, but essentially it is this one. It's not very important. I define what? Yes, Ex is the energy, the individual energy. So I write, uh, so it is, if you look at your notes, it is written, probably. It is the, the, the sum of the kinetic energy plus pot interaction energy plus potential energy. Okay, so it is the energy of the atom X, 
So if I look at the derivative of his energy, it is given, so you have some microscopic continuity equation with some microscopic current which takes this form, almost, okay? And then, what is pro to prove for his law, uh, what you have to do, in fact, is you have to prove that if his current has to be written like a discrete gradient, so here the nabla denotes a discrete gradient of some function, because you need, you want that sh to show that it is in fact proportional to the gradient of the temperature, so microscopically you have to, to show something like that. And, but in fact it is not, uh, usually it is not something that we can do, and what we do is that we can add some, some function, depending on the generator, apply to some function, which means that we add some small fluctuations. So when you integrate in time this guy, it is not true. You have plus still some other no, term. No, no, I'm saying, I'm saying it's not true that the gradient is fine. No, it is what you would like to do. Okay? If you want to prove for his law, it is what you want to do. You want to replace the current by the gradient of its function plus some perturbation in terms of the fluctuation. It is a fluctuating term. Integrated in time, it gives you some noise, like plus some correction terms. And uh, this has nothing to do with uh, the ergodicity. Even if the, the system is ergodic, it is still something else to do. So here it is a standard method which has been developed in the past, in the 90s, um, with essentially the work of that. And, is to prove this kind of uh, structure of the microscopic current, that you can write it like a discrete, discrete gradient of something plus some uh, small terms. This is small when you integrate in time. But you see this one is never a gradient. It is never a discrete gradient. Yes? In which case? Yes, ergodicity is necessary, but it is not sufficient. It is a, no, it is a, some intermediate steps. You need yeah, some yeah. local equilibrium, at least. Right. But look at, mm, because all the, all the statistical physics, non equilibrium statistical physics, is based on the concept of local equilibrium. We imagine that when you take a system. This is in relation with Fourier law. Your goal is to obtain Fourier law at the Yes, but uh, also, if you have Fourier law, you also expect to have a local equilibrium. Okay, just I wanted to say that it is. Okay, a local equilibrium is not sufficient to, to write such an equation. It is something else to do. So there is still some, some job to do. It is two independent problems, but uh, if you have Fourier's law, you expect to have local equilibrium. Yeah. This is a necessary step. This I don't, I don't know the feeling. Why is Fourier's law has something to do with... Uh, uh, you have to go to the details of uh, the, uh, the derivation of the Fourier's law. But Yes, it's true also, yes. So when you are able to write such an equation, you are able also to write the first equation to local equilibrium. So it means that you have more than just local equilibrium. You have the first order term to the uh, first order term after the local equilibrium. So usually you have a lot of microstochastic uh, dynamics for which the current is soon a gradient. It is called gradient system. And in this case, it is quite easy to derive atomic equation for his law. But for Hamiltonian system, like the system that consider it is never a gradient. So you have really a big job to do. And it is something that we are only able to do for in the case where the Hamiltonian dynamics is given by the harmonic chain. Okay, to write such, um, uh, such a decomposition. For standard, for standard anharmonic chain, we are not able to do it. So we have to turn to a simpler question. And the simpler question is to consider the the green Kubo formula, because if you have Fourier's law, you expect at least that the conductivity is well defined. So conductivity, you can define it by different setting, by considering the system out of equilibrium by con in contact with two thermal bars, or you can define also define it by the green Kubo formula. And in the rest of his lecture, I will be um, I will consider only the problem of uh, the green Kubo formula, how to show that the green Kubo formula is well defined. So, 
this is some easier step, rather than to prove directly through his law, we want to show that at least the transport coefficient is well defined. Okay. Okay. So, what is the? How you de do you define the, the transport coefficient? You define it by the green Kubo formula, which is the following. So it depends usually of the temperature, and uh, okay, maybe I will forget some thermodynamic parameters in front, but which are not so important. So here yeah, I will consider only the case dimension one and pinning potential with some pinning. Um, so it is given by the following formula. The interval from zero to infinity of uh, the space-time correlation of the current, which is the sum over x in the infinite lattice of the current that I defined here, the microscopic current corresponding to the energy, T respect the current-current correlation at different time, dt. So here I assume that uh, I had uh, some pinning potential, so I don't have conservation of momentum, and even with the, the stochastic dynamics, momentum is not conserved. So I don't have to subtract something to the current. And here it is uh, the current respect to the Gibbs measure, which is parameterized by uh, beta, the inverse of the temperature T. Okay? It is also, also conserved. What is conserved? The stretch. Ah, the stretch? Okay, no, here I am in the case where you have pinning. But, uh, so it is not conserved. You can. The stretch is still conserved. No, the stretch is not conserved. If you have some pinning potential, look at the uh, harmonic case, for example. Depends on the interpretation again. Formal is conserved. Yeah, it's it's conserved. But the point that now, now in the pin case, it was saying, you, you, you consider Q as a displacement from uh, a certain equilibrium position. It is not real. Okay, but uh, when you write, uh, okay, if you write uh, Newton's equations, the sum of the Rx is not conserved. It is not conserved by the dynamics. If you write the sum of the Rx and you take the time derivative, it is not conserved. But in this sense, it is not conserved. Rx is the Rx dot is Qx plus 1 minus Qx. Okay, yes, okay, it's true. Okay. Uh, okay, in this sense, you can say that it is conserved. Um, If you see it in this way, uh, okay, I have not. Uh, this, uh, um, it's formally conserved, but the velocity. The average of the velocity is always zero, because it doesn't go anywhere. For any Gibbs measure, the average of the velocity, you can, it cannot, it's not translation invariant, so you cannot make a different velocity of zero. So any, any stationary measure must have a velocity equal to zero. So that is formally conserved, but it's not going, going it does not evolve. It's, a, it's really trivial, then it's really a trivial uh, uh, reference to first time. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is uh, the, the green Kubo formula. So here, usually, sometimes you see the green Kubo formula, which is defined with the limit in the, um, in the system size by taking first a finite system and then sending the size of system to infinity. And, but what is expected is that so this uh, limit is in fact contained in the fact that I define directly with the sum over x in z. So I took the, inf the infinite volume limit here by taking by uh, summing over x in z. Okay. So um, okay, and uh, so this is a formal formal definition because 
apparently you don't know if it is uh, phase, uh, phase interval makes sense. It is an interval over some time. You need some decay of the correlation function. So first I would like to rewrite it in some different way in order to be able to, to, to give, uh, in order to, to try to prove that this coefficient is well defined. So what I do in order to, to make a more well-defined quantity is to introduce some, um, some extra parameter, some damping parameter indexed by lambda, which is integral from zero to infinity of exponential of minus, okay, sum over x and z, exponential of minus lambda t, gx, x plus 1, t, g0, 1, 0, dt. Okay. Then, if it is written in this way, this quantity then makes sense, and it can be expressed in some in more algebraic way in terms of the generator of the dynamics, because See, so here it is the integral with respect to the Gibbs measure. So this guy is the limit as lambda goes to zero. Of course, for the moment, I don't know that the limit as lambda goes to zero exists. Okay, but it is just a way to, to have a, this quantity now is well-defined, and I can study the limit as lambda goes to zero of this well-defined quantity. So this is the limit as lambda goes to zero of the integral from zero to infinity of sum over x in z, exponential of minus lambda t. Um, okay, sorry. So what I will do is that I will write, I will rewrite phase uh, sum over x in the following form. So I will exp explain what it is. Okay, what is this scalar product that I introduced? This scalar product that I introduced is just um, defined in the following way. So this is the sum over x in z. So you take the translation of the function f respect to the shift of the lattice tau x, okay, multiplied by g minus f g where this bracket denotes the expectation with respect to the Gibbs measure. Okay, so you see that the sum over x of the gx, x plus 1, t, g0, 1, 0, it just fits scalar product between g0, 1, t and g0, 1, 0. It's just some other way to write uh, this sum by using this scalar product. Now, g0, 1, t, um, you can express it in terms of the generator of the dynamics. It is the limit as lambda goes to zero, an integral from zero to infinity of exponential minus lambda t, exponential of tl g0 one, okay, because this is the generator of the dynamics, so the, at time t, the current is given by the exponential of tl, the semi-group applied to g0 one, g0 one zero, Okay, but now every, the time is uh, included in this semi-group, so I can forget every time. And then by integration, you obtain that is the limit as lambda goes to zero. Of, by integrating in time, you see that what appears is the resolvent of, um, of the generator. Lambda minus L minus one, G zero one, G zero one. Uh, this is a simple, computations, in fact, which permits to rewrite this green Kubo formula, which was defined with some integral, which a priori is not so nice defined in terms of some expression involving only the generator of the dynamics. So you have some algebraic, uh, algebraic definition, if you want, of the green Kubo formula, and all the, the goal, if you want to prove the, as the um, transport coefficient is def well defined, is to prove that the limit as this damping parameter goes to zero, um, uh, this quantity does not blow up. Okay. OK, 
Uh, and uh, so there is a theorem that we obtained with Stefan a few years ago, uh, which is that, in fact, for the dynamics with the flip noise, and for some generic potentials, even if you, are, you have to make some assumption, of course, on the, the potential, but it is quite a general class of potential. Um, the green Kubo formula, its limit here is well defined, exists. It means that the limit as lambda of C0 of its quantity is well defined. So you have some definition of, you have shown that the transport coefficient is well defined in this sense. Yes. In this case, the problem? Uh, no, here is uh, okay. You can write. We can write. But uh, here, here I no. I need to introduce this parameter lambda. In this model, there is problem if you have lambda. If I didn't have lambda, yes. yes. I don't know how to do because uh, I don't know how. Yes. It is infinite volume. You don't have a spectral gap, for example. No, I mean, no, if... <laughs> yes, but if you take lambda equal to zero directly, you cannot do it uh, super... If you don't take lambda, you have to define this quantity. You don't know if it is well-defined without the lambda. Yeah, in particular, it could be, it could be not absolutely convergent. Yes, it could be not absolutely convergent, yes. So the introduction of the lambda permits to, to deal with some well-defined object. But if, if you I start without the lambda, I don't know. In this case, there is a problem if you look directly from the For me, yes. Maybe you can do it directly by uh, analyzing his, uh, by studying his, uh, his integral. Okay. <laughs> so now we have some quantity, which is a transport coefficient, which is well defined. And uh, now this is the last part of the lecture. Uh, okay. Which is what I will. Um, I would like to have some information about this uh, conductivity, okay? And this is what I call the weak coupling expansion, which is based on some paper with, uh, so with Stefano, Calangelo Riverani, François Veneres, and uh, Joel Lebovitz. And so what is, uh, what, what is this uh, weak, coupling, weak coupling expansion? So you, you start with the system, which is, the, so I would consider this the case dimension one, pin system. And I would consider the case where the interaction potential is very small. So you have your chain. On each side, uh, you have a particle. And now the interaction potential is in the form epsilon v, okay, with epsilon, which is very small. And on each side, you have some potential W, okay, pinning potential W, and you have also the flip noise, which consists at random exponential time independently to, uh, to flip the velocity of site X. So the generator of the dynamics can be written in the following way. And maybe I have to use some notations. Okay, so now the generator of dynamics will depend on two parameters, which is epsilon, which is the coupling between the, the, the atoms, and also of gamma. Gamma is the strength of the, the flip noise, okay? And what is the generator? It is given by the sum over x of what I will denote by L gamma x plus epsilon g. So all the coupling is contained in this, uh, in this operator G. So here it is the generator of the dynamics when you don't have any coupling. So when you don't have any coupling, all the particles evolve independently without any interaction. So it means that you have only on each side, you have uh, particles, which is described by evolving with some potential W and with the flip noise, okay? So L gamma X is just given by the following, it is just um, Px 
dqx minus w prime qx dpx plus gamma times sx, where xx is a generator corresponding to the flip at x. Okay, so the generator describes the dynamics, the individual dynamics on each side, where you have uh, where you have a particle evolving in the potential W with some flip uh, at random exponential times. And then you have a G, which is the interaction potential, which is just given by the sum over X of V prime of QX plus one minus QX minus V prime of QX minus QX minus one, dPx. Okay, so this is the generator corresponding to the interaction between particles. When you don't have any coupling, the dynamics is just composed of independent dynamics. And then you, you start to, to, to put some, some interaction between particles. So now if you look at the conductivity, which is now well defined, it depends on three parameters, epsilon, gamma, and t, okay, and the temperature. So the temperature dependence in the temperature are not very well interested in, but I am very interested in the behavior of his, um, of his kappa in terms of epsilon gamma. So of course, when epsilon is equal to zero, the conductivity is, uh, is just zero. You don't have any interaction between particles. Now what, uh, what is the goal is, so what we would like to do, what we are very far to be able to prove anything of uh, what I will write, is to study to expand this uh, conductivity, which is now well defined in terms of the coupling. So first expand, expansion of, in terms of epsilon. So we would like to write kappa epsilon gamma t. Okay, I will forget the t now. We would like to write it like, okay, you see, since you have the coupling now, which is for the epsilon, the current between site x and site x plus one is of order epsilon. So the, it is clear that the conductivity which build at least of order epsilon square, okay? Because it is quadratic function in the current, the current is of order epsilon. So it will start with epsilon square, kappa two gamma plus epsilon three kappa three gamma plus and so on. So we like to expand, it is weak coupling expansion and then the second, the second interest would be study. In phase expansion now, you have some coefficient and we would like to study the limit as the noise goes to zero of each of these terms, kappa n of gamma. And then the natural question is, so assuming that it exists, okay? So assuming that it exists, that it is given by kappa n, then the third natural question is how of this new expansion, epsilon, the sum of the epsilon n kappa n, when you send, when you, after, after having sent the, after having sent the, the noise to zero, how is it related, is it related to the conductivity of the true anharmonic chain? of the, um, the conductivity of the true harmonic chain, so it means kappa epsilon is gamma equal to zero. Okay. Because we expect that uh, this quantity is well defined, the conductivity of the chain without any noise should be well defined. Okay. But now we do it in two, in two different limits. We first, um, we first um, perform the weak coupling limit and then we send the noise to zero, and uh, we would like to understand if it is, if, is, um, if it is related to the true conductivity or not. And of course, in fact, we are not able to solve um, this problem. I think it could be interesting to do it even from just a numerical point of view to understand if uh, we can do something. 
n is just uh, the, the parameters which appear in the, ah, in the expansion. The okay. okay. Mm. So this is uh, the game, and okay, my starting point is this formula for the uh, conductivity. And of course, you can say, okay, this lambda is not so important. It is just some uh, mathematical introduction to, it is just introduced to make sense of this limit and so on. And you could be tempted to, to forget this term, this lambda, in order to define the, the conductivity. So let me rewrite the conductivity kappa epsilon gamma, okay? It is with the scalar product we take into account the shift in the Gibbs measure. It is given by the following. Okay, it is a limit as the damping parameter goes to zero of lambda minus L epsilon gamma minus one. Okay, times the current, and the current will be proportional to epsilon. So I write it epsilon G01, epsilon G01. Okay, here epsilon G01 is the current, the microscopic current of energy at site zero, which is just um, epsilon uh, epsilon P0 times V prime of Q1 minus Q0, something like that. Okay, this is the current between site zero and site one. So, take lambda equal to zero directly, okay? And then try to perform some naive expansion. Okay, so you, you introduce this function u epsilon gamma, which is lambda minus L epsilon gamma minus one of epsilon G zero one. And then you try to write this, uh, this function as a sum of, so you, here you have a term, so naive expansion means that lambda is equal to zero, okay? I take directly lambda equal to zero and this guy is not so well defined. So I can try to perform some expansion. Of course, I expect that I will have to start the expansion at n equal one in terms of the epsilon n, u lambda n, u n. Okay, then if you do that, and you perform this expansion by uh, writing L epsilon gamma is some term of uh, constant term, so uncoupled dynamics plus epsilon times the interaction generator you develop, and so on, and you can get some, uh, some first, order, first order term. You can write that kappa, kappa epsilon gamma is equal to epsilon squared uh, times, um, you will get the following. G01 minus L0 gamma minus 1 G01. Okay, that you can also rewrite in terms of some time integral like the integral um, of uh, from 0 to infinity of G01 T G01 0 respect to the Gibbs measure beta dt, but here the dynamics is the dynamics corresponding to L0 gamma. It corresponds to the uncoupled dynamics, okay? Here you don't have any epsilon, so you don't have interaction. So each, in each cell, you have some, uh, some independent evolution, okay? Uh, which is uh, the individual dynamics given by L0 gamma, and you have some well-defined term. So if you forget this lambda, you get this result. And in fact, you can show that this interval makes sense. But it's so now that it is not the correct, the correct expansion. This is, this result is wrong. In fact, uh, now if you take into account the lambda, you get something which is where you obtain some correction to this term. Okay, so you don't have to, you have to be a little bit careful by doing this expansion. If you do it in the, naively you get something which is which gives you some result, but the result is not correct. 
So if you take into account the presence of the lambda and you perform the expansion, you get a different result. Okay, so since I don't have a lot of time, I, will, I don't write the, the expansion, I will write directly the result. Um, okay. Um, okay, maybe I can, okay, I, can, I have to write maybe a little bit. So now we take lambda strictly positive and make the correct expansion. Are introducing this lambda. In fact, uh, it turns out that it is better to 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 normalize this lambda by lambda epsilon square. It doesn't change anything, but for the computation, it is better. And then we can now, with the presence of this lambda, we can perform the the the, the, the expansion. Okay. And it turns out that in the expansion. So you have some hierarchy, and in this hierarchy, you have always the same operators which appears. This operator is given is given um, by this L gamma. So maybe I so I don't write the correct expression of L gamma, but this is operator which is a priori some any it can it is not clear that this operator has special properties. Um, but if it's some operator which appears everywhere in the expansion, okay? And what is interesting, in fact, is that this operator which takes a form which in principle uh, is not characteristic of a special properties of this, of an operator is a Markov generator. It is a generator of a Markov process. Okay, so operator L gamma appears in the hierarchy everywhere at each step, and it is a Markov generator. What is this Markov generator? In order to understand what it is, uh, let me explain some other results that have been obtained um, by uh, okay, Stefano and Calangelo which is uh, the weak coupling limit. And uh, in this weak coupling limit, we will see what is this operator. So imagine that you start a system, the system that I considered with uh, n particles, okay, interacting with this uh, small, this uh, potential epsilon v, where you have some pinning potential w, you have the noise, the flipping noise, and you have also the interaction potential between the particle epsilon v. If you don't have, if you don't assume that uh, epsilon is uh, small, what you would like to do, this would be the goal, would be to take the diffusive limit n square t. Okay, so you look at the system with finite system in the diffusive time scale, and you send epsilon goes to plus infinity, but taking epsilon of order one. Okay, you don't assume that epsilon is small. Then what you expect is to obtain the Fourier equation. So this is something that we, have not, we are not able to do even with in the presence of the noise. With, of course, uh, the conductivity which will coincide with um, the conductivity that we derive by the green in the green Kubo, um, in the theorem giving the existence of the green Kubo formula. But you can try to do it in two steps. The first step is to take the weak coupling limit. So you let n fix a finite number of particles, but you send epsilon to zero. So you have a very uh, small transfer of energy between the cells, and you, 
you have, of course, since you have a very small transfer of energy between the cells, if you want to see some evolution, you have to wait for a sufficiently long time. So you have to look in the time scale epsilon minus 2t. And in fact, in this case, it has been proved by, okay, by uh, Stefano and Carlangelo Ivani, okay, not exactly for this model, but a very similar model, that what you get here is some dynamics, stochastic dynamics, which is with the generator, which is given exactly with this operator. Okay, so this operator which appears in the expansion in everywhere in the hierarchy is in fact the same that we obtain by taking rigorously this limit. So, in fact, in this, uh, by writing this expansion, we are not able to prove that this expansion is totally correct, but at least we are confident in this expansion because the operator which appears in the hierarchy is exactly the same as the, the, the operator which appears here. So, it is the reason for which we think that our expansion is correct. And then, now, the, the goal would be also to, to to go in this direction by, now that you have a stochastic dynamics, a finite stochastic dynamics with n particles, okay, this stochastic dynamics is stochastic dynamics evolving only the energies of the cells. Okay, here it is a dynamics on the P on the Q, here it will be a dynamics on the energies. And then, if you take a second limit as n goes to infinity, you will expect to come back to some, and I will conclude with this question. For example, what is the behavior of kappa 2 gamma as gamma goes to zero? So, then you can build, okay, you have two different options. Or you think that by introducing the noise, you destroy completely all the properties of uh, the deterministic chain. So maybe if this, uh, this guy blows up, and maybe if it converts, it converts to something which, has, which is not related to the real deterministic chain. Okay? Or you can think that uh, by sending gamma goes to zero, you, you recover the first order term in the expansion on the conductivity for the deterministic chain. Okay? But it is not clear at all what happens. But at least what we obtain is the following. So there is three cases in which we can say something. So the first case is a trivial case in some sense because we can make all the computations explicit. It is the harmonic case. Of course, in the purely deterministic harmonic case, you, the conductivity is infinite. Okay? But what we can show is that, in fact, the kappa epsilon gamma is equal, this is some equality, it is not some approximation, it is exactly equal to epsilon square kappa 2 gamma, and we can compute this kappa 2 gamma, which is of order 1 over gamma. Okay, so at least for this, uh, for this harmonic chain, it is, we get something which is uh, consistent with what we could expect. So this guy goes, blows up, goes to infinity, and it is effectively when epsilon equal to zero, the conductivity of the harmonic chain is infinite. Okay? So, but it is not, uh, okay. But at least it shows that in this case it is uh, correct. Now, in the case of some anharmonic case, there is something which is quite interesting is that, and um, so here W, so we did the computation for this potential W equal to Q4, but it should be valid for N and for some other potentials. What we obtain is that kappa 2 gamma, so the first order term expansion, um, we were able to show that it is uniformly bonded as gamma goes to zero. Okay, so it means that it doesn't blow up. The the, when the noise is sent to zero, this first order term which appears in the expansion of the green Kubo formula remains bounded. It cannot have blows up. So now the question is, it is something that can prove, maybe if it's kappa 2 of gamma goes to zero. Okay. 
as gamma goes to zero. It is not excluded from these, uh, from these computations. And uh, this question is also related to the fact that when you consider just a deterministic chain, you could be interested in the, in the weak coupling expansion without introducing the noise. You would like to know if you can expand the conductivity in terms of the term epsilon when gamma is equal to zero. You don't have any noise. It is a deterministic chain. So it is not clear, in fact, some such, such expansion exists. And so if we add that this guy goes to zero, it, will, it could um, indicate that we don't have some expansion for the deterministic chain. But for the moment, we don't know if it goes to zero, even if we have some green Kubo formula for this guy. For this guy, we can write a green Kubo formula in terms of his stochastic dynamics, and we have to study some integrals. And, uh, but, and the variational formula, but uh, still we are not able to do it. Um, so maybe numerically it is something that can be doable, um, but we don't know. Okay. What would be the limit of the change? Okay. What, what the would limiting be? Limiting the equation. The, for this uh, kappa 2, you mean? Yeah. Uh, it goes to zero. Uh, so there are two options, or it goes to zero, or it goes to something which is finite, which is related to the first order term, which appears in the expansion of the... And if it goes to zero? If I think. No, if it goes to zero, what yes. is the limiting equation? Uh, if it goes to zero, it means that the conductivity of the truly anharmonic chain should not uh, should start from uh, with uh, the first order term could be zero. And maybe you can imagine that it is also true for every... Okay. Oh, okay. No. Okay, so, but... Um... Ah, yes, okay. Here, yes, if you have zero, yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, it is subdiffused. Okay, I didn't understand the question. Okay. Okay. Yes, if you have kappa 2 equal to zero, yes, it is subdiffused. Uh, okay. In this case, we didn't say anything. No, we don't know. We don't know if it is positive. Okay, uh, it is not this case. It is a case of anomaly chain. I will conclude with uh, the random masses case. Now there is a last case that we are able to do, which is a case where you have some uh, random pinning, in fact. So random case. So now what we do is that on each cell, the potential W is quadratic. In Okay, the V is also quadratic. The so interaction potential is quadratic. And W of Qx is equal to nu x Qx, where nu x is random. Okay, and strictly positive, bounded by some constant state, strictly positive. So on each cell, you have some, some uh, random pinning. So we know that in the absence of, uh, of any noise, this uh, uh, chain, because of uh, the localization of uh, the eigenmodes, you have conductivity which is equal to zero for gamma equal to zero. Okay, so it is known that kappa of uh, epsilon gamma equal to zero is equal to zero for any uh, for any epsilon. Why? Uh, no, no, sorry, it is Qx squared, yes, you're right. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, in, so in this case, you have localization, okay? If you don't have any noise. So now we put the noise, and then what we can prove uh, is that when you have the noise, which is strictly positive, uh, this goes, is bounded by C times gamma. So the conductivity itself goes to zero. Okay, you introduce the noise. When you send the noise to zero, you come back to the to the uh, to this guy. Okay, which goes to zero. And then in the expansion, what we are able to do is that to show that kappa two, the kappa two that we obtain in this uh, this expansion, also goes to zero as gamma goes to zero. Okay, all this is uh, rigorous. So you see, in this case, it, is, it indicates that you recover 
exactly. It is a very degenerate case because you have localization and so on. But in this case, at least, you get something which is uh, completely consistent with the fact that when you send the noise to zero, you get exactly the conductivity of the deterministic chain. Okay, but this case, as well as this case, how many cases are very degenerate cases? Okay, it would be very interesting to, to, to consider this case and to decide if this kappa 2 of gamma goes to zero or not. It's not so clear. Okay, I stop now since my time is over. So for the harmonic case, you explained that uh, K2 diverges as 1 over gamma. So yes. is it the same for Toda case as well? It is the same as what? A Toda lattice. A to Toda lattice. Uh, okay, Toda lattice, I don't know because uh, I uh, it will diverge with gamma, but it is not clear that it is 1 over gamma. And I don't, it will diverge for sure, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know, but it should diverge at least, yes. So the, the last, uh, the, the random case is, uh, the coupling is also uh, quadratic, is it? Qu coupling yes, is quadratic. they are also quadratic. In fact, we can do also something in the non-quadratic case, but we have to assume that um, the noise, the, you remember, the, uh, we have to put epsilon and gamma as to have to be dependent. So if uh, you take gamma as a function of epsilon, I don't remember exactly, but we can show that the kappa of gamma and epsilon goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero with gamma depending on epsilon. In the case, in the anharmonic case, okay. So even if you put some um, some anharmonicity, it still goes to zero with the noise. But uh, this is only for gamma. It is not gamma. It's not fixed. It depends on epsilon. So I don't remember if gamma has to be smaller than epsilon or if it has to be bigger than epsilon. But uh, we have some result in this direction. Any other questions? Remark? No? Okay. Thank you to the speaker. Mm -hmm. We'll resume at 11.30.